The challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. And King, on you, Husky. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush with Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. The trail down the hillside was steep and narrow. Shorty Sprague braked his sled hard to keep it under control during the sharp descent. Easy, Carlin. Easy, Dave. He's easy. The passenger on Shorty's sled was a beautiful blonde girl clad in a lynx parka. Both Shorty and the girl had their eyes fixed on another dog team that was climbing the trail several hundred yards below them. Finally, the girl spoke. Shorty, isn't that one of Hasker's men driving that sled? It sure is, Miss Gilbert. His name is Joe Gault. Joe Gault? But he's the worst of the lot. He's big and he's mean. Maybe we'd better pull over to one side and wait till his sled goes by. Don't you worry, ma'am. We're going downhill. So we've got the right of way. Shorty took it for granted that the uphill Easy. sled would give way according to the custom of the trail. Easy, you But as the two teams Easy. drew Easy. close together, he realized that Galt had no intention of pulling aside. A moment later, the two teams came face to face. Whoa, 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 whoa. Shorty halted his team with difficulty, whoa, barely whoa, in time whoa, to prevent whoa. a clash between the opposing whoa, sled whoa. dogs. He shouted angrily at Galt. Hey, what's the idea of blocking the trail? Get that team of yours out of the way, Spray. The downhill sled has a right of way. It's your job to pull aside. Besides, I'm carrying a lady. Maybe you don't hear so good. I said get that team of yours out of the way. I'm not taking orders from you or any of the rest of Hassler's wolves. The only direction this team is moving is straight ahead. For a sort of front, you're talking mighty cocky. I guess you need a little lesson in manners. Don't you dare start a fight with Shorty. Well, you're twice as big as he is. Don't you worry, Miss Gilbert. I've run up against polecats his size before. Why, you... Oh! Oh! Galt's punch caught Shorty squarely in the face and crumpled him over backwards with blood streaming from his oh. nose and mouth. You rotten bully! That's just the beginning. Wait till you see what else I'm going to do to him. All right, get As Shorty get struggled weakly to his feet, Galt was ready with another blow to the head. Oh. But Shorty rolled with a punch and came up fighting. Oh, he defended himself yeah. gamely, but the fight was unequal from the first. Galt was a full head taller than Shorty and at least 50 pounds heavier. In a few minutes, he had battered the smaller man into submission. Oh. Uh, I guess you learned your lesson, Sprague. And just to make sure you don't forget it. With deliberate cruelty, Galt jerked his helpless Come opponent on. up off the ground and smashed him in the face with another terrific punch. Oh, you unspeakable beast. Uh, let me give you some advice, girlie. The Yukon is no place for a woman. If you're smart, you go back where you came from and stay there. I came up here to operate my uncle's mine, and that's exactly what I intend to do. All right, you've had your warning. Now get your team off the trail. Here, give me those traces. Ha oh, there, you husky. Oh. Galt drove Shorty's sled into the snowbank at one side of the trail. Oh, oh. And with a final threat to Marsha, he returned to his own sled. Remember what I said. The Yukon is no place for a woman. Marsha Gilbert was still trying to revive Shorty? the unconscious Shorty several minutes later when Sergeant Preston drove up the trail. Okay. Looks like you've had some trouble here. Can I help? Oh, I'd be grateful if you would. I'm Sergeant Preston, Northwest Mounted Police. And I'm Marsha Gilbert. Glad to know you, Miss Gilbert. What happened to your friend here? He was beaten up by a man named Joe Galt. Joe Galt, eh? I'll well, soon bring him around. Incidentally, who is he? His name is Shorty Sprague. He's one of my employees at the Snow Queen Mine. Well, know this brandy ought to help. Uh, holy smoke. What hit me? Take it easy, Shorty. The fight's all over. Uh, who, who are you? He's Sergeant Preston of the Mounted Police, Shorty. Uh, howdy, Sergeant. <laughs> Guess I must look pretty funny. Well, you've got a black eye and a split lip, but your nose is still in place. It doesn't feel that way. Suppose you tell me what the fight was all about. We were going downhill. Joe Galt was on his way up. I expected Galt to 
steer his sled off the trail. He should have. But he didn't. He blocked the way and tried to bulldoze me in to pull on the side. I gave him an argument. I guess maybe that is my mistake. It didn't matter, Shorty. No matter what you did, he'd have found some excuse for picking a fight. Well, what's Gold got against Shorty? Nothing. Except that he works for me. What do you mean? Galt wasn't acting on his own hook. He works for a man called Hassler, Martin Hassler. I've heard the name. Heads a mining syndicate of some kind, doesn't he? Yes, that's right, Sergeant. He's been buying up all the claims on the Last Chance Creek. The only property he hasn't been able to get his hands on is the Snow Queen Mine. Which belongs to you. Yes. I inherited it from my uncle six months ago. Hassler's been trying to buy me out ever since I took over the mine. I take it you aren't selling? You bet I'm not, Sergeant. The Snow Queen is worth twice what he's offering. Hassler thought it'd be easy to swindle me because I'm a woman and I'm new to the mining business. When he found out I wasn't quite so gullible as he thought, he changed his tactics. How so? He began trying to intimidate me, to bully me into accepting his offer. He evidently intends to make things so unpleasant for me, I'll, I'll be glad to sell out. So that's why Galt picked a fight with Shorty. Yes. He and the rest of Hassler's men have already scared off four of my crew. Shorty here and my foreman, Mike Muldoon, are the only employees I have left. I could arrest Galt on a charge of assault and battery, but he probably wouldn't get more than a few days in jail. He deserves life. That still wouldn't stop Hassler. What if it wouldn't be better for me to camp here in the neighborhood for a few days and look into the matter? Might be able to get something on Hassler that would justify legal action. Sergeant, if you could do that, it would... Well, it'd be wonderful. All right, I'll see what I can do. Sergeant Preston drove to the Snow Queen mine with Marsha Gilbert and Shorty Sprague. Marsha introduced the sergeant to her foreman, Mike Muldoon, an elderly, bald-headed man who had formerly worked for her uncle. She also invited the sergeant to stay for supper. You said you used to work for Miss Gilbert's uncle, didn't you, Mr. Muldoon? Mm. That's right, sergeant. I worked for Dave Gilbert for over a year before he died. How much gold are you taking out of the Snow Queen these days? Oh, uh, she's been paying about $100 a day lately. Your operating expense must run nearly that high. Oh, mm. yes, it does. We're hardly making any profit right now. Mine's not petering out, is it? Oh, definitely not, Sergeant. The ore is running pretty low grade at the moment, but I have a hunch the vein gets a lot richer farther on. Mm. I hope you're right, Miss Gilbert. I'm sure of it, Mike. Uncle Dave wrote me just before he died that the Snow Queen was good for four or five hundred dollars a day. And he certainly wasn't the kind to make rash statements. Quiet, King. Sounds like someone's coming. What? Looks like Joe Galt. What? That's who it is. Galt. I wonder what he wants. He's got a lot of nerve coming here after what happened today. I'll go and talk to him. Yes? What is it? Someone here at the Snow Queen has been stealing our gold, Mountain. Of all the barefaced lies. You've got no right to come around here and make a statement like that. You shut up. I'm doing the talking. All right. All right. Now, there's no call to get so tough. What I mean to say... Never you mind what you Muldoon mean. hasn't got the backbone to stand up to Galt. I'll go talk to him myself. Sit still, Miss Gilbert. I think maybe I'd better have a few words with Joe Galt. What seems to be the trouble out here? Hey. Marty. That's right. I'm Sergeant Preston, Northwest Mounted Police, if you want a formal introduction. And you're Joe Galt. How come you know my name? I heard how you beat up Shorty Sprague on the trail this afternoon. It was his own fault. I told him I to won't get... argue the point, for the moment at least. Just tell me what the trouble is right now. The Snow Queen crew has been robbing us. Can you prove that? I... I know I can't prove then it. Then you'd they... better tone down your language. Listen, Marty. You're not wise to the setup around here yet. If you were, you wouldn't. Be... I've seen enough to know that your accusation is probably untrue. Now, if you want to report a robbery, do it in the proper way. Let the police make the charges. I've already told you the Snow Queen crew robbed us. They took at least a thousand dollars worth. Either they kick through with that gold, or I'm gonna. You're going to what? <laughs> Mighty brave, aren't you, with that big Malamute to back you up? King, go back, fella. Go on over there in the corner and lie down. Unwillingly, King backed away from the door and lay down in the far corner of the room as his master had commanded. Just stay quiet, boy, and don't move no matter what happens. Understand, fella? All right. 
go. Now, what was it you were going to tell me? Galt stared sullenly at the Mountie for a moment, measuring the power in his broad shoulders and the cool determination in his steel blue eyes. Finally, his glance wavered. Ah, uh, never mind. Sorry, I'm not quite as small as Shorty. Maybe you could arrange to wear stilts at our next chat. You're making a big mistake, Marty. My boss has plenty of pull in the right places. He can have you broken any time he says the word. This conversation never was very interesting, and it gets less interesting by the minute. You'd better be on your way, Galt. I'm leaving. But you'll be hearing mighty soon from Martin Hassler. Sergeant Preston declined Marsh's invitation to put up for the night at the mine bunkhouse. Instead, he pitched camp in the hills overlooking Last Chance Creek. He waited for over an hour after seeing the last light glimmer out in the buildings at the Snow Queen mine. And then he announced to King, We're going down there, fellow. Have a look inside that mine shaft. <laughs> Little too much of a coincidence that the gold should start petering out just when Hassler's trying to buy the mine from Miss Gilbert. I have a hunch we'll find that the Snow Queen is just as rich as ever. Come on, King, I'll take a lantern to use inside the shaft. The Snow Queen mine consisted of a large tunnel into the hillside, with several cross cuts and side galleries leading off the main shaft. Sergeant Preston examined the cuttings in the main tunnel and then began to explore the side galleries. Well, King, the mine doesn't look any richer than Muldoon said. Maybe my suspicions were all wrong. Spider fella. Hey, you're right, someone's coming. Better blow out the lantern. Let's hope he didn't see the glow. Sounds like he turned down the next gallery. Come on, King, we'll follow him. Creeping back to the main shaft, Sergeant Preston felt his way through the darkness to the opening of the next gallery. In the distance, he could see the glow of the mysterious visitor's lantern. Cautiously, he made his way closer. The man's back was turned toward Sergeant Preston. He was using a pick to loosen large chunks of earth and rock from one wall of the tunnel. The sergeant watched for several minutes and then stepped forward into the circle of light from the man's lantern. Put up your hands, Muldoon. Preston, why, what are you doing here? I was about to ask you the same thing, but I guess there's no need to. It's quite obvious. I, I just came down here. To rob your employer, just as you've been robbing her ever since she took over the mine. No, no, you've got me all wrong, Sergeant. Don't lie, Muldoon. I wondered why the gold should start petering out just at this particular time. Now I know. Why, what do you mean? The Snow Queen mine's just as rich as it ever was. But you covered up the biggest gold vein so Miss Gilbert wouldn't know it existed. I suppose you've been coming down here at night all along, chipping away at the gold and covering up your traces before morning. You're pretty smart, Preston, but not smart enough. As Muldoon spoke, he swung his pick in a sudden vicious me. blow at the sergeant's head. But the sergeant sidestepped, and at the same moment, King charged. Help! Help get this dog away from let me! Let go of that pick and King will let you up. All right, all right, I'll let go of it. All right, King. On guard, boy. Stand up, Muldoon. Yes. That's better. Now start marching, and don't try any more false moves. Sergeant Preston marched his prisoner to the mine bunkhouse and held him there for the rest of the night under the watchful eyes of King. The following morning, he reported what had happened to Marsha Gilbert. So that's why the mine has been paying so poorly. I, I didn't take very much. Whether you took $10 or $10,000 does not matter. The point is I relied on you because you worked for my uncle. Now I find you're just a common thief. Shall I arrest him, Miss Gilbert, or do you prefer not to prosecute? Well, what do you advise, Sergeant? Well, I doubt if you'll get your gold back, whatever you do. Furthermore, if you do press charges, you'll have to go to Dawson for the trial, which means you won't be here to keep an eye on the mine. Under the circumstances, I think you might as well let him go. Very well. I'll do as you say, Sergeant. You're fired, Mike, but I won't press charges. Get your things together over at the bunkhouse and get off my property within the next half hour. All right, all right. I'm leaving right away. Why did you ask me whether I wanted to prosecute, Sergeant? I thought you'd arrest him automatically in a case like this. Ordinarily, I would. But I had a reason for letting him go. What do you mean? Has it occurred to you that Muldoon's little game fitted in very neatly with Hassler's interests? 
I don't understand. By covering up the richest ore streak in your mind, Muldoon made it seem that the Snow Queen was in danger of petering out. It may be he was less interested in robbing you than he was in persuading you to accept Hassler's offer. You mean he's really been working for Hassler all along? It's possible. I think we'll find out for sure by letting Muldoon go free. How will we find out? When he leaves here, I'll trail him. I have a hunch he'll go straight to Hassler. Sergeant Preston's hunch proved correct. After leaving the Snow Queen mine, Muck Muldoon went several miles down the creek on foot to the office of the Hassler Mining Syndicate. Martin Hassler, a heavy-set, bearded man, was chewing on a cigar and talking to his henchman, Joe Galt. He looked up in surprise as Muldoon entered the office. Muldoon! What in thunder are you doing here? I've been fired. Fired? What for? I was down in the mine last night, chipping away at the main ore streak. The Mountie caught me red-handed. You mean the same Mountie that run me off the property yesterday? That's the one. You blundering fool. Was it my fault? How did I know he'd be spying on me? You should have used your head, that's how. This will clear the whole deal. Yes. She'll never sell now that she's found out about that hidden vein. What are you going to do, boss? Uh, I'm afraid there's only one thing we can do. What's that? Get rid of Miss Marsha Gilbert once and for all. You mean kill her? Let's not use that word, kill. What we'll do is blow up her cabin at night. Now, if she happens to be inside at the time, <laughs> well, it'll be just too bad. Huh. It'll be too bad, all right, for her. Only look, boss, isn't that taking an awful chance? How so? I mean that Mountie, Sergeant Preston. If anything happens to the dame, won't he suspect us right away? Yeah, that's right. You fellows are the first ones he'll think of. Now, wouldn't it be better to wait till he's out of the neighborhood? Don't worry about the Mountie. I've got ways of putting the quietus on him. Official ways. Besides, even if he does suspect us, there'll be no way of proving we did it. So long as we don't leave any clues... What do you want us to do? Does the girl sleep right there at the mine office? Yes, that's right. She uses the back room as her private living quarters. All right. Then listen. The three of us will go over and scout the place tonight. If the coast is clear, we'll plant some dynamite right under the office wall. Enough to blast the building to splinters. And we'll light the fuse and make our getaway. How much dynamite should we use? We don't want to cave in the mine tunnel. We'll leave that to Muldoon. He knows all about blasting... Okay, I'll handle the dynamite, but you two better keep a good lookout while I'm planting it. Don't worry about that. Just be ready to start at 10 o'clock tonight. In the meantime, go on over to the bunkhouse and stow your duffel. Mike Muldoon left the syndicate office. As the door closed behind him, Joe Galt turned to Hassler and said, You sure Muldoon ain't right about that Monty? Maybe it would be smarter to wait till he's out of the neighborhood. <laughs> Muldoon doesn't know it, but I'm counting on that Mountie being around to investigate the explosion. Huh? What's Mike, the idea? Mike Muldoon just got fired this morning. That means he's got good cause for harboring a grudge against the Gilbert girl. What about it? When the Mountie looks around for clues, suppose he finds Muldoon's body lying somewhere close by, maybe 20 or 30 yards from the blast with scraps of wreckage littered all around him. Yeah. Yeah, I'm beginning to get it. It'll look like Muldoon set the dynamite for revenge, but didn't use a long enough fuse. Before he could get away, the stuff exploded. And Muldoon got knocked out by flying wreckage. Knocked out, or maybe even killed. How does it sound? <laughs> You're a smart man, Hassler. A mighty smart man. Unknown to Hassler and his two henchmen, Sergeant Preston had trailed Muldoon down the creek to the syndicate office. Returning to the Snow Queen mine, the Mountie reported what he had seen to Marsha Gilbert. Then you were right, Sergeant. He's been working for Hassler all along. Looks that way. In any case, he's on Hassler's side now. What do you suppose they'll do next? I don't know, but it may be something drastic. Why do you say that? Well, now that you know about that rich vein of gold... Hassler probably figures you'll hang on to the mine tighter than ever. You'll have to do something drastic to get it away from you. 
Yes, you're right. I, I never thought of that. Does the prospect scare you? Not a bit, Sergeant. Good. I rather think Hassler will overstep himself on his next move. When that happens, we'll have him right where we want him. Are you going to stay here at the mine till he shows his hand? No, I don't think I'd better. That might scare them off. However, I will camp in the hills where I can keep an eye on things. And I'll have King patrol your property at night. In that case, I certainly won't worry. <laughs> you know, I have almost as much faith in King as I do the mounted police. Marsha Gilbert had gone to bed, and the cluster of buildings at the Snow Queen mine were shrouded in darkness. Only the northern lights flaming across the sky relieved the gloom of the Yukon night as Martin Hassler and his two companions approached their destination. What about the dynamite, Muldoon? Are you sure you brought enough to do the job right? Don't worry. I've got just the right charge. When the blast goes off, the mine office will be blown to smithereens. But the tunnel will hardly be touched. I'll just make sure the fuse is plenty long. We don't want the stuff going off in our faces. At that moment, King was patrolling the wooded slope just in back of the mine buildings. His keen ears caught the rustle of underbrush and the faint whisper of voices in the distance. Pricking up his ears, he trotted forward in the direction of the sound. A moment later, the shifting wind conveyed to his nostrils the scent of human beings. Instantly, the great dog charged down the slope. Hey, what's that? It was Galt who first heard King's snarls and saw the charging husky loom up out of the darkness. It's a watchdog. Look out. Look, Galt. It'll make too much noise. Get him off of me. Do something. King's first assault had knocked Galt off his feet. A second later, he turned to deal with Hassler, who was kicking at him wildly, fearful of the husky's slashing fangs. Meanwhile, Muldoon had dropped the sticks of dynamite he was carrying and was running toward the mine entrance, where he knew a pile of loose lumber was stacked. He snatched up a heavy piece of wood. This'll fix him. Returning to the scuffle, he found Galt and Hassler struggling frantically to ward off the dog's savage lunges. Look out, I'll get him. Husky whirled just as Muldoon swung his two-by-four. The blow struck King on the head, leaving him dazed and bleeding. Again, Muldoon swung, and this time the great dog sank to the ground unconscious. Uh, good work, Muldoon. Yeah. Uh, what do we do now, boss? Muldoon, you gather up the dynamite planted under the mine office like we planned. All right, all right. Don't you stick around here. Keep a lookout in this direction. Right. I'll go over on the other side of the mine buildings and keep a lookout on that side. And while I'm at it, I'll listen in here if anyone starts moving around in the bunkhouse. Now, wait. What happens when I'm through planting the dynamite? When you're finished, come and get me. I'll be standing by that big pine over near the bunkhouse. Then we'll circle back and join Galt on this side. Is that understood? Yes, hi, Sammy. Me too. And don't forget, Muldoon. Make that fuse plenty long. A short time before King attacked the three crooks, Sergeant Preston had left his camp and headed toward the Snow Queen mine. He intended to inspect the area periodically throughout the night to make sure that all was well. As the sergeant neared the mine, Galt heard his footsteps approaching through the darkness. The crook ducked hastily out of sight behind a clump of rocks. <laughs> Holy smoke. It's the Mountie. For a moment, Galt's hand strayed toward his gun. And then he realized that the noise of a shot would ruin Hassler's carefully laid scheme. But he knew, too, that he must act quickly before the Mountie discovered his companions. As Sergeant Preston passed directly in front of his hiding place, Galt sprang out at the Mountie. I'll fix you, Mountie. Galt. Yeah, that's me, and how do you like this? Oh. The crook's sudden attack caught Sergeant Preston off guard, and he staggered under the impact of Galt's terrific punch. But he recovered quickly and smashed back at his assailants. You should keep your left up, Galt. Oh. Why, you... Galt struck out savagely, but this time Sergeant Preston blocked the blow. The Mountie oh. slashed back. For the next few minutes, the two men slugged it out toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Gradually, Galt weakened under the sergeant's punishment. Twice he went down. And as he picked himself up the second time, Sergeant Preston said, Well, what about it? You had enough? Yeah. Yeah, I've had enough money. Don't hit me again. With his attention concentrated on the fight, That's Sergeant all. Preston had failed to hear Hassler okay, and Muldoon no. sneaking up behind him. Just now, on. as Galt struggled weakly to his feet, uh, Hassler stepped forward yeah. and brought the butt of a revolver smashing down on the Mountie's head. Oh. Hey, you got here just in time, Hassler. What are we going to do with the Mountie now that you've knocked him out? I'll tell you, Muldoon. We're going to do the same thing with him that we're going to do with you. Oh. <laughs> you knocked Muldoon out, too. Yeah, this was as good a time as any. Now we'll have to drag them both over near the mine office. You're going to fix it so the Mountie gets blown up, too? It's the only thing we can do. Come on, hurry up. Give me a hand. 
That fuse isn't going to burn forever. Yeah. Galt half dragged, half carried the limp body of Sergeant Preston, while Hassler did the same with Muldoon. The mine foreman's body was deposited about 20 yards from the mine office. Then Hassler lifted the sergeant's leg. Here, I'll help you carry the mounty. Where do you want him put? Right up next to the mine office, near the dynamite. What's the idea? We want to make sure Muldoon can be recognized. With the mounty, it doesn't matter. In fact, it'll suit me fine if he's blown to bits. Okay. All right, lay him down right here. Yeah. Hey, look at that fuse, boss. Huh? It's almost burned down to the end. Come on, let's get out of here. Fast. Meanwhile, the great dog, King, was stirring painfully at the spot where the three crooks had left him. As consciousness came flooding back, the dog's instinct told him that his master was in danger. He sprang up and began running back and forth frantically, seeking to pick up the sergeant's scent. Suddenly, King's ears caught the sound of running feet, and a second later, his nostrils picked up the scent he was looking for. The great dog sprinted forward. Warily, King circled past the two men running side by side through the darkness. Guided by his nostrils, he headed straight for the spot where he knew his master must be lying. A moment later, he saw the sergeant's body, and close by it, the sputtering fuse. King knew the meaning of such an object from past experience, and instinctively he tramped out the fuse with his trail-hardened paws. Then he turned to the sergeant and began licking his face. A safe distance away, Galt and Hassler stood waiting in vain for the unexpected explosion. Finally, Galt spoke. That dynamite should have gone off long ago. Something must have gone wrong. Yeah. When we dumped Preston, there wasn't more than 30 seconds left in that fuse. What do you suppose happened? Uh, the fuse fizzled out. That's what happened. Come on. We'll have to go back and light it again. Sergeant Preston was just coming to as Galt and Hassler approached the building. In the darkness, the two crooks failed to realize what was happening till they were less than 10 yards away. Hey, look, Hassler. Yeah. It's the Mounties' dog. Yeah, you're right. And the Mounties' getting up on his feet. I'll soon fix that. Galt reached for his gun, but before he could draw, King charged toward him at lightning speed. The revolver was barely out of his holster when the great dog leapt on the crook, knocking the gun from his hand. A second later, the other crook recovered from his confusion and made a frantic effort to draw. I'll get him. But by this time, Sergeant Preston was on his feet. As Hassler reached for his gun, the Mountie fired from the hip. Oh, my arm! Stay where you are, Hassler. Hey, call your dog off, Preston. All right, King. Let him up, boy. I'm good. Get up on your feet, Galt. Yeah. All right. All right. Just don't let that dog get any closer. Who's that lying over there on the ground? Is that Muldoon? Yeah. It's him, all right. If he's dead, you'll both hang. He's not dead. He's just unconscious. We were going to wait till after the explosion, and then... Shut we... up, you fool! So you were planning an explosion, eh? I suppose you intended to blow me up along with Miss Gilbert, and then leave Muldoon's body nearby so it would look like his work. It wasn't my idea. It was Hassler's. He planned the whole you thing. sniveling fool It doesn't matter who planned it. You were both in on it, and you'll both stand trial for attempted murder. You're under arrest in the name of the Queen. Preston, you must have been born under a lucky star. If that dynamite fuse hadn't fizzled out, you'd be in kingdom come this minute. Huh? I didn't know I'd had such a close call. And what makes you so sure the fuse fizzled out? Why, it must have. Nobody put it out. I wonder if King didn't have something to do with that. <coughs> well, fellow, I suppose I'll never know for sure... But I can tell you one thing, boy. I'm mighty glad this case is closed. Now, here's Sergeant Preston with a preview of our next adventure, The Case King Takes Over. The man who murdered Mike Kramer's friend, Sam, left a trail that even a Chichaco could have followed. Mike and I were sure we could bring the killer to justice without any trouble at all. You see, I trusted Mike. I didn't know that he was in on the murder scheme and that his job was to kill me. Be sure to listen to this exciting adventure Wednesday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Wednesday... Until September, when we shall resume our regular Monday, Wednesday, and Friday broadcasts. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck till next Wednesday. <laughs>